We will start off with 90 second opening statements in alphabetical order. So welcome candidates and thank you for participating this evening. Um, so please introduce yourself. Tell us which neighborhood you live in and why you are running for District 6 Supervisor. And to start, I'm gonna start with uh, Ms. Billy Cooper. Ms. Billy, if you could use microphone. Oh, we have virtual attendees, so the Hi, everyone. My name is Miss Billy Cooper, and I am a 63-year-old, unapologetically black, transgendered woman, and I have lived in District 6 for 40 years. My, my whole existence has been in a tenderloin until we were redistricted into District 5. The tenderloin became District 5. So I had to move south of market, but I lived south of market before. But I have been a long time activist and advocate. I'm a person, a long time survivor living with HIV, and I've been clean and sober 20 years. And I believe it's time for a change in my district. I've been doing street politics the whole time. You know, I came to San Francisco in 1982 and hit the streets running because of all the confusion and and anger and, and segregation and just the whole gamut in the Tenderloin and oppression and, you know, and, and homeless people on the streets. We pretty much have the same, the same issues in the Tenderloin now that were going on 40 years ago. And it's time for a change. And I am that change. My name is Miss Billy Cooper and I hope to win, win your vote or hi out there, your vote out there, people in TV land, because I know what we need. Thank you, Miss Billy oh, okay. Cooper. The next candidate we'll hear from in our opening statements is Sherelle. Good afternoon. My name is Sherelle Jackson, and I'm running for Board of Supervisor District 6. You know, I'm dedicated and committed to serving our underserved and marginalized communities to be a strong voice for this district. I wanna serve our seniors, our disabled communities, as well as those that are veterans. Um, I also wanna to continue to make sure that you have an understanding of the work in my background. Some of that work includes being a member of SEI 10 to 1, working with labor and ensuring that they have and advocate in that regard. Co-chair of Workers with Disabilities, uh, the Women's Committee, as well as the AFRAM Committee as well, uh, serving on the Social Economics Committee. I do a, con a lot of work, community activism here in the city, making sure our homeless individuals have the resources that they need in order to thrive and placed in good housing. Um, and so I've done a substantial amount of work, being the executive producer of Rosemount Podcast as well, uh, and just really making sure uh, that I provide some of my time to help those who need it the most uh, and ensure that we can continue to uplift folks where they're at. Thank you. Next, I'll go to Honey Mahogany. Thank you, I'm Honey Mahogany. I'm also running for District 6 Supervisor. Um, I grew up here in San Francisco, um, but my family actually did not. They came to this country, like many others, as refugees um, from a, a long war. Um, my father at the time was a medical student studying in Greece, and he protested against the Ethiopian government, um, which revoked his citizenship, he lost his scholarship, lost everything, and he and my mother came to San Francisco seeking refuge and to build a new life. And when they came here, they really believed in the American dream. That is that through hard work and education, you can do anything. That's why my dad, instead of being able to continue his work in medical school, none of his credits transferred, he worked for 30 years as a taxi driver to put his kids through school. And they sent us to Catholic school because my family was deeply religious, but also because they thought it was the best way for us to move forward. Um, and while I didn't agree with everything the Catholics taught, what I did agree with was the teaching of being a person for others being of service and being the change you wanna see in the world. That's what drove me to become a social worker. I got my MSW from UC Berkeley and I've been working to get folks off the streets and into care, getting folks into recovery and helping those who are formerly incarcerated rebuild their lives. That's why I have done the work over the last 20 years to help make San Francisco a better place, working to establish the cultural districts, saving our small businesses and much, much more. With everything that's happening across the country right now, we need San Francisco to continue to be a refuge for people, not just people coming here from all over the country, but, or, or all over the world, but also from other places in this country. Thank you. 
And finally, for opening statements, we'll have Matt Dorsey. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I want to thank the League of Women Voters, and also I really want to thank UCSF because it's a little bit personal for me. One of the proudest uh, things that I ever did in San Francisco politics was in 2019 when I had the opportunity to stand shoulder to shoulder with some UCSF leaders like Stan Glantz and Valerie Yerger and John Ma to take on Jewel Labs when they were spending millions of dollars to uh, change San Francisco law so they could sell vaping devices. It means a lot to be here. Um, it was the convergence of a public health crisis in drug overdose deaths in my own personal journey in recovery from addiction that moved me to ask Mayor London Breed to consider me as her appointee to the Board of Supervisors for a job I never thought I would want, let alone have. Um, but having the opportunity to be here um, gives me, I think, a rare and unique voice on the Board of Supervisors against the backdrop of a record-shattering crisis that is twice as deadly as COVID-19. Um, I have said that I'm not going to be a single issue supervisor or a single issue candidate. But if there is a single issue that could make progress on a multitude of things in San Francisco, getting more people into recovery would make a meaningful difference and enable our city to be worthy of being the city of St. Francis. Thanks. Thank you all. Now we'll move into the questions that were submitted by the audience in advance. How do you define affordable housing? And what specific actions will you take to increase affordable housing in District 6? And for this question, I will begin with Sherelle. How do I fund housing? We need to make sure that it's affordable. Uh, for me, in my perspective, I'm looking at working class and lower income individuals and making sure that when the, the jobs that they are obtaining, uh, can they afford housing in that regard? And if they can't, that means we need to make more of it available. Um, and that is a mile marker in my respect, um, especially for our seniors and lower income individuals who have a hard time obtaining housing uh, because it's at market rate, uh, because of their fixed incomes. And so I wanna ensure that we provide enough housing uh, that's available for them to obtain it and it needs to be affordable. Thank you. Go ahead, Honey Mahogany. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, truly, for me, affordable housing means when working class people or poor people can afford to live there, that's what calls it, that's what's affordable housing. Um, I know this deeply because um, my family, again, came here as refugees with nothing. And at, in the, when they came here in the late 70s, that was possible. They were able to find a small apartment in the sunset and crammed you know, four or five of my family members in there. And then me and my brother were born and my grandmother came to live with us, but we were able to get by. Unfortunately, today, um, that's not the case. I don't know how people do it now. I mean, we are still getting refugees from across the country, but more and more we're getting more trans people who are coming to San Francisco seeking to rebuild their lives. I mean, I just met someone the other day who said, yeah, I came here from Alabama because I was not safe back home. Um, and for me, it is deeply concerning that we do not have enough affordable housing in San Francisco. And we do need to build more housing at all levels. But the city needs to also take into consideration how it's building deeply affordable housing here. It's been my life work. As um, executive director of the Trans District, I fought to get more deeply affordable housing and rental subsidies into um, here in San Francisco. When I was chief of staff at the Board of Supervisors, we also fought for legislation that we passed, creating, making sure that those who live in SROs pay no more than 30% of their income towards their rent. So I've worked on a variety of different things to ensure that San Francisco is as affordable as possible, but we still have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thanks. So I define affordable housing the way that the state defines affordable housing. And I think it's, wor it's worthwhile of looking at what the regional housing needs allocation or RENA targets um, that are gonna be governing how we're gonna build housing over the next eight years as part of our compliant six cycle housing element um, is gonna do that. There's very low housing, which is about 50% of AMI or area medium income. There's, uh, it goes to low income, which is 50 to 80%, moderate income, which, get, which is about 80 to 120. Um, and then sometimes, you know, there's, there, in Prop D, it can go up to as high as 140. 
Um, I think sometimes we need the flexibility of that because we don't know when we're baking something into the charter how the economy is going to be in years to come. But we have very aggressive targets. And as District 6 supervisor, one of the things that I said in my very first speech after being sworn in, it's not enough as a District 6 supervisor to be a reliable vote on housing. The District 6 supervisor has an obligation to be the conscience of housing for the entire board of supervisors. If we're going to fulfill the promise of the most progressive and ambitious housing element ever in this city, we have to make sure that we're building and supporting housing, not just in our own district, but also in every district at all income levels. And we're also meeting the aggressive targets of affordability that the state has set. So I'm committed as supervisor to making sure we fulfill the promise of the most progressive housing element in San Francisco history. And the last to answer question is Ms. Billy Cooper. Hi, everyone. Um, Low income housing is what we need. Poor people cannot afford affordable housing. That's number one. Because I am one of those people. And until I got a Section 8 voucher to afford a beautiful place in Trinity apartments, Trinity places, that's how I'm living there. I couldn't afford that. Affordable housing is, is a, a pushback to poor and low income people. You know, most people that live in all this affordable housing are tech people, or you go from third and market all the way up to Castro and market, all that is affordable housing, BMRs. A poor person can't afford a BMR. So I just want to say, I know, I know exactly what's happening. I'm my street politics, I have, I'm an activist and an advocate, like I said, for over 40 years. I am the face of the Tenderloin. I am one of many faces of the Tenderloin. Let's not forget, we, we can't forget all the, the other communities in District 6, but we got to stop leaving out the marginalized and the poor people. We have to get them situated in housing. Um, during this COVID scare, so many people were on the streets right outside City Hall, sleeping up, up on a pallet and a, a, a mattress and sometimes not even sleeping in a tent. Just because you're not there, that doesn't mean you shouldn't care for people living below the poverty line. Thank you all. I'm going to ask the audience to hold the applause until the very end. Thank you. So question number two. What are your plans for bringing retail business to the area? For this one, I'll begin with Honey Mahogany. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's no, everyone here should know that San Francisco has been hit really hard by the pandemic, but even before the pandemic happened, small businesses were really struggling. The rents are just too high, and unfortunately, foot traffic isn't what it used to be, and it's not enough to support those rents. I know this deeply as a small business owner. I'm one of the co-owners of The Stud, and in order to save that small business, 16 friends and myself got together, put the funds together to save that business from closure. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, we were forced to shut our doors, but we're actively working to bring it back. Unfortunately, there is a lot of issues when it comes to zoning, zoning and permitting and all the costs that it takes to actually open a small business. When it costs more than half a, mil or half, a, half a million dollars to open an ice cream shop in this city, <laughs> that is a problem. That's something that we need to work on. And so I am gonna continue the work that I have been doing as a small business advocate, working with the Small Business Commission, working with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development to make sure that we are taking the burden off of our small businesses. That's why I opposed the previous tax that was about to be on the ballot, and luckily it's getting removed. But we have been taxing and hurting our small businesses to the point where they are no longer allowed to survive. We have to do something about it, and we ask, have to absolutely change the conditions on our streets to support our small businesses, increase tourism, increase foot, uh, foot traffic through um, restructuring of our streets, and get people back into our small businesses and shops. Thank you. So um, what I'm hearing from small business owners in District 6 is that the main concern is public safety on the street. Um, it is street conditions. It's people who are acting out violently. Um, in many cases, especially in my neighborhood, I live in mid-market, in the mid-market area. It's open-air drug scenes, brazen drug dealing, um, and people acting out, often violently. 
Um, there's the owner of Harvest Market, a friend of mine I've known for 20 years, who was attacked and knocked unconscious. This was something that we haven't seen in prior, prior years. Mark Sackett, who works a block away um, at the box, was a, had just had surgery on his wrist. Um, he's talked about this openly. He was attacked because he told somebody to stop kicking a door. Um, Tony Baloney's wife was attacked because she told somebody to stop shoplifting. It's a, a degree of um, public safety issues that I have not seen in the years, the 14 years that I've been living in South of Market. I think we also have to, um, I think the other thing that I have talked to big, large companies about is what we can do to encourage people to come back and to stop doing remote work. I know that we are a, a tech-heavy city, and sometimes that plays out in this being a labor kind of work benefit. But I'm, I have said I'm willing to open up the hood on the gross receipts tax if it means incentivizing people to come back to work, because ultimately that's what supports small businesses. Hi again. It's Miss Billy Cooper. I am running for District 6 Supervisor. I want to talk about policy, and I want to talk about legislation, and I want to talk about, you know, there are people that do and there are people that don't. And for the last 40 years, the city and county of San Francisco has not gotten it right because of people of color, white people, Asian people, Mexican people, no, there are no businesses for low-income, marginalized people. You know, they said the cities, I spoke um, to someone with the city, and they said, Ms. Cooper, they need seed money. A poor person don't have no seed money to start a business. The city needs to create, um, you know, legislation and policy to afford people to get uh, to, to be able to open a business. I've been here 40 years, and I have very rare, I've seen black people and brown people working in a business, but that what they was just doing, working there. They didn't own nothing. So I just said, we got to make it more cohesive and equal to everybody, and not only in District 6, but across the city. We have to help people that really want to help themselves but can't. So many people can't afford a decent meal. I was one of those people, but when I got my housing, my life changed, and I'm so grateful. I'm a United States disabled veteran. That's how I got my Section 8 voucher, and I'm so grateful. All right, so we've, we've got to hit this in, in multiple different ways, okay? So we've got to create tax incentives that help out businesses, especially those that are impacted by the pandemic. Uh, we also need to ensure uh, that we, vest, we start to invest back into business um, and create a, a way in which they feel supported so that they are able to obtain the resources they need in order to thrive and make sure that their businesses are running efficiently, um, especially for those defaults. Uh, we also need to ensure that our um, that we are addressing community safety. I, I heard uh, uh, another candidate mention that, and I think I, I agree with that. Uh, you do need to address safety as well. Um, this is one of the things that is a concern is those that are in organized uh, crime that kind of affects the retail industry, especially when you're thinking about the square and, and these things. You have to address those in a way that you're providing community safety, making sure that the staff inside the retail industry, um, I worked in retail before, I know, I know what happens in, inside those stores. And um, sometimes it's not the very safe uh, conditions for them to be able to conduct business. And so we have to ensure that their security is, is in place, but also investment in our community safety ambassadors are available, ensuring that they have the resources they need. Um, and then making sure that those resources are available for uh, uh, impact, right? So making sure there's grants available when folks need them for uh, marginalized and lower income small businesses that need those resources so they can start up. Uh, there's a lot that we can do in the way that we address this, so thank you. Thank you. Next question. Could the city create a bus route that goes from Mission Bay to SFO Airport? For this one, I'm going to get, begin with Matt Dorsey. I think that we could do that. I know that one of the things that um, plays out in transit so often in the San Francisco Bay Area is that we have, 20, I believe, 27 transit agencies, and there is a lot of balkanization in that. Um, I think 
that there are, I mean, this, it's the, this is the first, actually, this is kind of refreshing, because it's the first time I've gotten a question that's, that is uh, kind of novel. Um, yeah, this is something that I would be willing to have a conversation with um, Jeff Tumlin about at Muni, um, or private sector. I know that there are some private sector uh, shuttles here as well, but if that's something that uh, is, would be helpful to this area. I do, I am a strong believer in what we need to do here in Mission Bay. Uh, back in the dot-com era, I worked on Berry Street when this was a place where people were hitting golf balls. You know, I remember this with being a place where Frank Jordan, I think it was the Jordan administration, was talking to UCSF about it, some of the growth issues they were encountering on their Parnassus campus. And the discussion was, you know, maybe we should m look at Mission Bay. And I think this is fulfilling the promise of a an area that is a life sciences cluster, and I am committed to making this a success. So if, it, if a shuttle to SFO would do that or any kind of transportation infrastructure, I'm committed to it just as I'm committed to the to Mission Bay Elementary School. Is, is that my question too? Yes, go ahead, Ms. Billy Hi. Cooper. Um, I just want to say that would be a gangbuster. That would be a fabulous idea because so many people that live beyond UCSF and Gentech and all these buildings right here and all these fabulous apartments and giant stadium who live further down 3rd Street, most of those people can't afford $16 one way in a shuttle to go to the airport. I remember before all this was here, the 15, the historical 15 bus used to come down 3rd Street, used to come down this street. I remember I used to eat across the street at the, the firehouse before they tore it down where the sisters used to prepare meals for the low, poor, marginalized people. This is my neighborhood. This is my neck of the woods. You know, I, I have done street politics, and I'm just waiting to get in City Hall as District 6 supervisor, honey, because they really need to be taught a lesson about how to run things. But it would be fabulous because I'm disabled, and I love taking the BART to the airport, and it's half price. $4 each way. So I would actually come down here to catch the bus to go to the airport because it's an experience for low, marginalized, poor people to actually be able to afford to fly out of the airport. You know, so that's a fabulous, fabulous idea. And if you need my help, I'm here. I'm available if you need someone to sit on the board. And that's another thing. We need marginalized and poor people on some of these boards. How are you going to, how are you going to create... How are you going to create stuff for us if we're not on your board? Thank you. Next, Pharrell. Yes. The question is, could the city create a bus route that goes from Mission Bay to SFO Airport? So my answer is probably a bit more simple than that. I, I would say that, yes, I think it's a great idea. Uh, a lot of folks do a lot of business back and forth. Um, you've got companies and industries that have to get to where they're going. Uh, and this may be an efficient way to reduce traffic. Think about the environment. Think about how that uh, it will reduce the amount of traffic back and forth and everything else um, if there's a route that's directly for those that are residents that are, that are here in the, the city and in this district. Um, I also think that we also need to ensure that we're looking at transit and, and public transit in general, ensuring that there are safer routes uh, so that uh, the, our care providers can get to and from the hospitals. Uh, ensure that they uh, continue to have investment there, uh, and, and also uh, making sure that, uh, you know, I know that there's some work in, the, uh, is in regards to uh, the Chase Center, which is down the, the street here, um, that, you know, when there's games and everything else, that could be a concern. So um, I just wanted to make sure that we also ensure that we continue to make safer routes uh, for those that are getting the care that they need. Yes, so I, I believe that we, that is possible and something we absolutely can do. Um, I would actually, though, prioritize making transit more reliable um, in San Francisco and in District 6. Um, BART already goes straight to SFO, um, so why are we not then actually making access to BART easier by improving um, how often Muni comes, whether it be the T-Line or whatever it is, the N. Um, we know that there is transit that connects Mission Bay to the downtown area. We just need to make sure that it is reliable and that it's coming quickly enough. So rather than start a new shuttle, I would prefer to actually um, uh, reinvest in the resources that exist to make them reliable, more consistent, come more quickly so that folks can get to SFO safely. 
Thank you all for our uh, answers. Um, just as a reminder, these questions have been submitted by the audience in advance. Um, so the next question, uh, do you accept PAC funding from outside California? And if so, from who and why? I will begin with Miss Billy, Miss Billy Cooper. No, I don't. I don't accept no PAC funding. <laughs> Matter of fact, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> But no, running for District 6 supervisor, we, we have a threshold. You can only take so much money from uh, donors, and you're not allowed to take money from corporations and other outside entities. But I wish I could have, but, you know, say la vie. But no, I think uh, there should be some kind of um, um, policy, and we should relook the structure of when people run for District 6 supervisor. In any district, you should be able to get more money from you, someone that backs you and wants to fund you. Because I don't have a whole lot of money. You know, uh, you know I might lose this race, but I, I know my heart has always been in the right place for 63 years. And you know, if I'm lucky enough to win, I will do everything within my breath. Every, this, everything while I'm living, and in a district six supervisor to help the poor marginalized people. I know other people that got money live in district six and need help too, but my, my heart is with my people, people that look like me. You know, I have stage four cancer, I have one eye. You know, so many disabled people are kicked to the curb because there's no one that looks like them that represent them. But I'm here to say, I know I gotta stop, I'm here to say, I am for my peeps. Thank you. Cheryl Jackson? Uh, so I haven't been taking any money in regards to out of, out of state. Is that what it was? Um, I'm, I'm very modest. So <laughs> that's just not something I'm doing. And, you know, I'm just trying to run a good race, uh, decent leader with integrity, uh, with honesty and respect for the folks that are running next to me. Uh, and we'll continue to make sure that the rest of this race is uh, respectful and uh, I uh, want to run it that way, and hopefully other people can take this as an example in a way that you see a black woman up here that can run without being dis disrespectful or unkind to other folks and just continue to represent in that way. So thank you. Um, for, for me, the vast majority of my contributions, in fact, all of them have come from individual donors. The only exceptions have been from unions who have contributed to my campaign. Um, but also there are some national and statewide organizations that have endorsed me and that have contributed $500. For example, California Women's List has contributed $500. Other organizations um, that may be endorsing like the Victory Institute or Fund, which is a national organization, you know, they may contribute $500 and I would, yes, accept that. Um, but there are organizations and groups that I will not accept money for. Um, obviously, those um, on the far um, right wing, um, those who are, um, you know, serial evictors, um, people who are, um, you know, private prison companies, things of that nature, um, um, private oil or oil companies. There are certain things that are or groups that I will not accept money from. But again, a vast majority are all coming from either individuals um, or e labor unions. And my, my donors are also largely um, individuals. I think um, to the extent there could be something out of state, it might be a, a couple labor union endorsements that I've gotten where I've gotten checks, but I believe most of those are also from in-state. So I would, I would happily uh, take a look at that. I certainly haven't uh, solicited anything from out of state. Um, and most of the you know fundraising that I have been doing is for among people that I've known for years. and. Um, you know, it's the uh, early round is usually the love money. So that's it for me. Thank you all. What was the end that you said to you? So it's, they'll call it sometimes in fundraising circles, love money. It's just like your friends I'm and gonna family. I'm going to move on to the next question. Thank you. <laughs> so So um, what is your comprehensive plan to address public health? I'm going to begin with Sherelle Jackson. Yes, yeah, so this is also uh, something that we have to hit to ensure that, well, number one, that we're making sure that our diverse and disadvantaged communities uh, have the 
access to, to care, uh, making sure that mental health is being addressed and resources to access to care is available. Uh, I also want to make sure that our seniors have access to health care and making sure that it's accessible to them, especially our disabled and vulnerable communities uh, who need access to that care. Um, and also women um, and black women who may feel sometimes um, uncomfortable with these conversations about getting access to care and going to hospitals and getting care when they need it the most. And um, I want to make sure that, that uh, you know, organizations that are available and are providing those resources, that they're getting to the communities that need them um, and that women feel more comfortable with that and just having that representation uh, be available uh, to them all. So definitely want to ensure we get, get the access to care in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, there's a lot that needs to be done uh, to improve our public health care system. Um, this is something that I have worked on extensively, both as chief of staff to the former supervisor, Matt Haney, but also as someone who, you know, has had to access um, public health services. Um, as a black trans woman, we do know that there are a lot of, there's a lot of very specific care that we need in our community. Um, and luckily here in San Francisco, we have that covered. Unfortunately, with that care, as long as a long list of other types of health care, mental health care, et cetera, the waits are often far too long and in some cases can be deadly. Um, I think that this is actually what is creating the crisis in our streets. Um, we know, I have, my partner worked for years um, at, uh, at General as a, uh, as a nurse in the mental health, in the uh, psych ward. And he would tell me that they were constantly full, that there was nothing that folks could do, that people had to be triaged in the emergency room and then turned back out in their hospital gowns, and that is unacceptable. It is not enough for the city to just purchase beds or create facilities. We also have to support our healthcare workers and making sure that things are properly staffed. That means paying people a livable wage so that we can recruit people to these jobs. That means also making sure that we're funding these programs adequately so that they are appropriately staffed. Because what ends up happening is people burn out and then folks don't get the services that they need and we create the chaos in our streets. That's why I'm proudly endorsed by SEIU UHW, SEIU CIR, and many other healthcare workers in this race. On the um, public health challenge that San Francisco is facing that is probably more serious than anything we have faced since the height of the AIDS crisis. Uh, last week, I proposed, along with Supervisor Raphael Mandelman and Supervisor Catherine Stephanie, an ambitious roadmap called San Francisco Recovers that seeks to address the record-shattering crisis in drug overdose deaths together with the criminal justice aspects of that that deal with drug dealing and other, other kinds of things. It is an ambitious program. That I spent four months reaching out to national leaders like David Kennedy from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York, Bo Kilmer from the Rand Corporation who worked with my predecessor, Supervisor Haney, on the Street Level Drug Dealing Task Force, Mike Marshall from Oregon Recovers, um, and, and many others to identify the things that have worked in other cities, including European cities that have done a better job of addressing the challenges, the public health, and the criminal justice challenges that go along with this complicated issue. Uh, what we did are we we're asking 21 city departments to report back to the Board of Supervisors within 90 days on the steps they could take, what resources they need to do what other cities are doing. Um, this is important to me. You can count on the fact that this is never going to be an issue of the month for me. It's why I'm here. It is nothing less for me than the obligation of my own survival. Miss Billy Cooper. Cheryl didn't want to give me the mic. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, public health. Honey, I'm glad you brought it up. You know, public health is a very, I remember 40 years ago, public health was a big issue then. And it's crazy that it's still a big issue now. I mean, we're in the richest country in the world. Why don't we have universal health care? You know, poor marginalized people basically don't get the right diagnosis. They get pushed out of hospitals like my um, fellow, um, my fellow people, my fellow board of supervisors, um, y'all said. Um, candidate said, thank you, I'm a little nervous. But um, yeah, um, I'm, one of those, I'm the face of one of those people who got misdiagnosed for years. I know what it's like. I know what, like I said earlier, 
It's people that do, it's cities that do and the cities that don't. San Francisco, wake up. We know exactly what we have to do. We have to do. But it's a shame that they haven't done it yet. So I'm here for change. Do we want a 12 more years of the same politics that we just got, that we just, that just left? Do we want 12, do we want 12 years of the same nothing that was there before? It's time for change. You know, put, put me, put someone like me, someone from the other side of the tracks in City Hall. You know, let me, let me bring up my game. Let me show you what I can do. You know? Thank you. I wish we got more time. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's how it always feels up here, doesn't it? Uh, so returning to the topic of affordable housing, how can new construction in areas like Soma be used to address the problem of housing for low income and unhoused individuals and families? We'll begin with Honey Mahogany. Thank you. Um, again, this is something that has heavily impacted my community. Uh, as a black person who grew up here in San Francisco, I've been really shaken and appalled to see how many black people have been forced out of the city, including many of my family members. When we first moved here, um, when I was born here and many of my cousins were born here, there were about 30 of us in the city, and now there's only two of us left in all of San Francisco, and people just keep getting pushed further and further east. Um, I've spent the last... Uh, 20 years working on this issue, whether it be fighting to get rental subsidies in place so that people can afford to stay housed, which we know is the most, the, the most cost-effective way of preventing homelessness and crisis. Um, in the last four years as Chief of Staff to Supervisor Haney, again, I've worked on affordability issues with the 30 Right Now legislation that we passed, but also in preserving units in SOMA, permanently making units permanently affordable by the city, acquiring them, whether it be through the small site program or the purchase of large-scale um, buildings like the panoramic, for example, so that it could be used for people transitioning out of homelessness. The city must do more, and I am committed to finding new streams of funding to fund deeply affordable housing in District 6. We've said yes to so much, including navigation centers, and we need more. We need places for people to transition out of homelessness. We have them, and we need more. But not only in District 6, I will be fighting to make sure that the rest of the city does its part. We absolutely need the rest of the city to step up and continue to support the work that we need to do to get folks off the streets and into housing. I think um, it, it is a sad commentary on San Francisco's failure to produce enough housing and enough affordable housing that it is going to be the state of California that is finally going to make this happen. And not just for San Francisco, but I think the state the state legislature and the governor have had it with municipalities that are not doing their part and doing more to stymie progress rather than shape it. In the next eight years through the six cycle housing element, our city has to build 82,000 units of housing. About 40% of that has to be affordable at different levels of affordability. And we're gonna have to have some serious conversations about not just if we can't get Right now, we can't get a fourplex legislation through the Board of Supervisors. We're going to be needing to talk about tenplex. That is something that I reached out to the Department of Planning on to make sure that we can do things like local versions of St State Senator Scott Wiener's SB 10 and SB 50 that are ambitious, that are bringing solutions as big as our problems. If we're going to hope to make progress on affordable housing, we have to think that big. We have to think that creatively. And if we don't, the consequences of failure are immense. We could lose state funding for transit, we could lose state funding for affordable housing, and we could lose local control altogether. That'll all disproportionately affect District 6, which is why I'm going to be a champion for affordable housing in the Board of Supervisors. Ms. Billy Cooper? Low income housing, low income housing, why don't, why don't people say low-income housing? Why is it affordable housing? Affordable housing is not low-income housing. My constituents, my people can barely afford to, to live in the SROs, can barely afford a, 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 a studio somewhere. So many people in San Francisco are on disability, Social Security, SSI, um, uh, um, uh, what you call it, unemployment. 
Can't nobody afford. You got to have something set into place where they're allowed to pay 30% of their income. So many apartments here in District 6, buildings in District 6 or condominiums have been empty for years while people are dying on the street. We don't really know the correct number of people that die on the street, whether it's from fentanyl or whether it's from um, heroin or whether it's from crack. We need to sit down at the table. Listen, San Francisco people, San Francisco people, we need to sit down at the table and create better policies. Y'all know exactly what y'all not doing. Come on now, I don't gotta sit here and keep digging a hole, you know, and you know, hoping that it's gonna get filled up with housing for people. You know, we need, a f we need low income housing. I, I hate that word affordable housing because I couldn't afford affordable housing. When I was, when, before I got my section eight, low income housing from section eight was the one thing that changed my life and it can change many more people's lives too. Yes, yeah, so we've got to address this issue. Yes, we do need to build housing, right, here in the city. Uh, what we're not addressing, though, is the fact that a lot of folks need uh, good-paying jobs, right, to live here, to afford here. Uh, and if you're, you know, we've got to work with these industries and these companies out here uh, that are providing the employers, I mean, excuse me, the, providing good wages for employees. We've got to think about it uh, in that regard as well. Because if people are, have good paying jobs, they're able to afford their housing, right? They're able to pay their rent and their bills and put food on the table. Um, so we also have to address that. And I think you also um, are alluding to ensuring that not only are we addressing and making sure that there's enough housing available, uh, that we create rates uh, that are at the rate in which people are obtaining their funding. So the average amount of people here in the city, how much are they making, right? So we need to be looking at that as well. Uh, and then uh, correlating that with the, the kind of pricing that we need to have available uh, for folks. And I think that that would make it a more competitive, uh, not, excuse me, not a competitive, but more uh, available and accessible for folks. Uh, and addressing issues like uh, ensuring that we reduce, um, well, I won't go into that. Um, I'll just say that the last part is that I wanna make sure that we provide affordable housing make it available, ensure that people have the resources they need it to afford it, uh, and create a lower income housing as well. How are you going to meet the needs of all of the constituents, including the new ones, of your district after the recent redistricting process? I'm going to begin with Matt Dorsey. So this is this is interesting. Uh, you know, I was uh, one of the board members of um, Mid-Market Neighbors during the redistricting process, and the concerns that those of us in Mid-Market had was that redistricting risked um, taking a neighborhood that is defined by Market Street and then dividing that neighborhood by Market Street. We were opposed to um, splitting Tenderloin off. The most elegant solution was actually to keep Tenderloin and South of Market together. Um, candidly, when I was having a conversation early on about whether I, you know, was the, whether the mayor might want to talk to me about um, being appointed or being interviewed to be appointed, um, I, I actually assumed because the rationale for my own, uh, you know, candidacy for the board of supervisors was so based in the drug crisis that's raging in the Tenderloin and South of Market, I assumed that when redistricting happened and it, the two districts were split, um, that I wouldn't be the appointee. Um, it is still relevant to SOMA. Um, but one of the things that we have to remember as supervisors is we, are, we may be elected from districts, but we serve the city. And I have made a commitment to my colleague, Dean Preston, that I will be the best supervisor that Tenderloin never elected. And I invite him to be the best supervisor South of Market never elected. We have the ability to work together on a lot of things. We will disagree on some things. But on the things we agree on, for our neighborhoods, we can be joined at the hip, and I'm going to be that, I'm gonna continue being that kind of supervisor. Ms. Billy Cook. Sure, still didn't give me the microphone. <laughs> 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 um, the redistricting, um, it was, it's horrible, it's horrible. Because I had to move, I lived right on Gary, I lived on the last street 
that was in District 6. I had to move south of Market to, to run for District 6 supervisor. I wasn't going to let that stop me after 40 years living in District 6. I wasn't going to let myself be pushed out and the um, Office of Election telling me I couldn't you know, um, get sworn in to run for District 6. So I had to move. And it's, I'm sure I'm not the only person who had to move because of their subsidy or because of their lifestyle. But the Tenderloin is my, my home. The Tenderloin is, was all that I knew. Before I knew it was District 6, it was just the Tenderloin. And I'm, I'm making the, the promise right now. I'm going to be rolling my sleeves up, going out, talking to people, going to dip, talk to different property managements and, develop, and developers and get things right. Because we, we cannot continue to keep leaving people on the doorstep, on the curb, outside. We have to bring everybody in. It really saddens me to see people sleeping on pallets and mattresses and blankets. It really saddens me for all the people that the city is just pushing towards one area that are out there selling drugs and using drugs. We have to find them. We have to create a better cohesive way. Okay, um, yeah, this is a time where we need to ensure that we're inclusive, making it open, working with our other Board of Supervisors to ensure it's inclusive. Uh, you know, we have a very diverse San Francisco. Uh, this is a place where we can, you know, ensure that it stays and remains inclusive, making sure people feel invited, supported, right? These are our neighbors. We need to make start acting like it and make sure that people have what they need, the resources, invest in them, recenter folks and, and people here in the city. Uh, and sure that people feel comfortable. And I think that we can all uh, agree uh, that we want the best uh, for San Francisco, but we also want the best for District 6. And the way that we do that is to continue to make sure that we're providing the resources we need in order to uplift our communities, making sure our disadvantaged and underserved communities have the resources that they need, but also making sure that we bounce back from the pandemic, right? Making sure that um, our business industries are invested in Right, so they can uh, our small businesses, and they can make sure that they are uplifted in that regard too. Um, and I think we can do that full full heartedly, and make sure we're safe at doing it too. So that's what I think. Um, for me, um, you know, this is a very personal question. Um, I spent the last four years working as chief of staff in the District 6 office and have had the opportunity to work really, really deeply with a lot of community groups throughout SOMA and Treasure Island. Um, but for me, this goes back way further. Um, I've spent the last 20, year, 20 years working as a social worker in this district, um, in the south of Market, in the Tenderloin as well. Um, and unfortunately, we did lose the Tenderloin as a part of the redistricting process. But, um, you know, in some ways that does lessen the load a little bit and allow us to do really concentrate on some of the other parts of the district. Um, so, so the West, West Soma, Central Soma, the East Cut, Mission Bay, Treasure Island, Showplace Square, I mean, all of, the, all of the rest of District 6 deserves a lot of attention and needs that attention in order for us to recover from the pandemic. Again, as a small business owner, I know the struggles of many of the small businesses in this neighborhood, and I've worked with many of small businesses, whether it be wine bars like Decant, or whether it be um, bars like Oasis, or uh, The Eagle, or um, restaurants, many other organizations. Um, I have deep roots with working with um, the Filipino community in uh, the South of Market, whether it be SOMCAN or SOMA Pilipinas or West Bay or United Playas. I've worked with all of the CBDs, both from, from SOMA West to East Cut to Mid Market and Civic Center CBD, um, downtown CBD. Um, and there is an intricate network of support systems that can be bolstered and utilized to best serve this district. The next question, according to the CDC and San Francisco government data, there were 297 fatal drug overdoses in San Francisco between January and June, 15% of which occurred in SOMA. What is your plan to address this issue? I'll begin with Ms. Billy Cooper. 
as someone who used to run the streets using drugs, I know it's very, and purchasing drugs off the street, I know it's very, and I've been clean for 20 years. So it's been, it was real difficult for me to get clean and sober. We have to continue to be better at meeting people where they're at. Um, you know, the people that are selling drugs on the street to the people that are sitting right next to them, you know, if even if we were to arrest all the drug dealers, the people on the street, when you're a dope addict or when you're an addict, you know where to go get drugs at, whether it's right next door to you or whether it's a couple miles away. We need to, you, to utilize people that are clean and sober f for, for numerous years to help, you know, uh, get the people into recovery. But everybody doesn't want recovery, and we can't force recovery on people. But we need to have a, a plan laid out for people in addiction that want recovery and that want it, that want to use it, that wants to utilize it, and hopefully to have a better way of life. But then we can't really say that somebody's life that their life, I can't say that another addict's life is screwed up. I don't know where that person is coming from. I can't say that. I will never say that. But as an ex-addict, as someone who used for over 25 years, I'm going to do everything in my power to get out there and help the people. I'm, like I said, I'm going to roll up my sleeves, right. and I'm going to be out there. Thank you. I'm going to move to Sherelle Jackson. Yes, yeah, so we need to invest in um, self-harm reduction models uh, we, we do this already in some of our private sector as well, um, in our nonprofits. Uh, we also need to make sure that there's a heavily investment in our clinicians and uh, clinical facilities, as well as our hospital and health care providers that are already providing sus substance abuse prevention and also mental health care. Um, we need to make sure that they have the resources they need to in order to conduct their job. We also need to invest in our community safety options. Um, and also ensure that we have those resources available and um, we recognize um, some other issues that need to happen, like investment in our community ambassadors. I said that already, but I want to make sure that I uh, indicate that. And then investment uh, in making sure that we establish transitional programs uh, for those that are ready to you know, begin the process of uplifting themselves out of these conditions uh, into better conditions to build back their life, because that's really what we're looking at. Uh, folks that are struggling, um, continuing to have this sort of cycle in and out of jail systems and things of that nature. We got to invest and make sure that there's opportunities for them to get into jobs and workplaces that they are eligible to work at. And if we're not building up their skills in order for them to be eligible for jobs, we're going to continue to see a cycle um, of folks just struggling on the streets because we're not investing to ensure that they have jobs in, uh, in this workforce. And we've got to we've got to full recenter and focus in that regard. Thank you. Yes, we have had a huge drug problem in San Francisco for a long time, and with the introduction of fentanyl, it has become even more deadly. Um, unfortunately, we have not done a good job of addressing the needs. Um, this is something that goes back decades. Again, as a social worker, someone who's worked for 20 years on some of these issues, getting folks off the streets into recovery, my very first job was being an outreach counselor for Larkin Street Youth Services. I've seen what it looks like on the ground, and over the last four years working in City Hall, I've seen some of the ways in which the city has failed to respond. The city has failed to listen to providers who know the work, who know how to get folks into care, who know how to keep people in recovery and how to help people succeed. Um, it has chronically underfunded many of these programs. And sure, you can purchase 100 beds, but if you're only funding enough clinicians to get 10 of them staffed, then guess what? You're only serving 10 patients. So I believe that we need to fully fund Mental Health San Francisco. This is legislation that I actively worked on as an aide and chief of staff in Supervisor Haney's office. We also need to, uh, I also want to acknowledge that we did work to establish a state of emergency. Um, I wrote the resolution establishing the state of emergency here in San Francisco around overdose deaths. And that I supported the TL emergency and the establishment of the TL. The, the, the TLC, the center, which basically served as a safe consumption site. And I am very, very, very in, in favor of overdose prevention sites as a way to deal with the issue. We need accountability on our streets for the people there, but first and foremost, we need accountability for the city. So the loss of life is staggering. 
Um, since the advent of COVID, we have lost about 900 San Franciscans to COVID-19 and about 1,700 uh, to drug overdoses. 75% of those fatalities to drug overdoses are attributable to one drug, fentanyl. The minimum lethal overdose of fentanyl is about two milligrams. Um, our police department is in the tenderloin is taking, will by the year's end, take about 55 kilos of fentanyl off the street, which is enough to wipe out the population of the San Francisco Bay Area twice over. What's terrifying to me is that on the East Coast, there are Narcan-resistant synthetic opioids. God forbid, if that comes here, we will have a public health calamity that is worse than the AIDS crisis. That is why I ask for this job. It's why I propose the most ambitious and far-reaching plan that I have seen or in, in the experts that I've talked to have seen since um, this crisis started here. Um, it includes aggressive public health strategies like treatment on demand, 24-7 intake. It includes taking a serious look at the things we need to do with a criminal justice system to make a meaningful intervention. It's right to recovery programs. It's sober New Deal programs to give people purpose who are early in recovery, and it's making sure that we expand our uh, transparency so that our city has a better handle on what it's doing right and what it's doing wrong. Next question. What is your position on Proposition B? This is the one about the Public Works Department and Commission, Sanitation and Streets Department and Commission. For this one, I'm going to begin with Sherelle Jackson. Um, well, I haven't taken a formal position on this. I do believe that we need to ensure uh, that we provide resources for our public utilities. We need to make sure that um, we're also working to ensure our city is a safe, clean, uh, and efficient, and it's got to operate in that in that respect, in that regard. Uh, that means making sure that uh, our you know our streets are can, on a regular basis being cleaned, uh, making sure that we invest in our environmentally and friendly options uh, that will help um, not cause too many toxins while they are conducting business, uh, ensuring that there are resources available for that as well, and then also supporting uh, different operations within the internal system. Uh, that needs also some assistance there, especially making sure that people will begin to trust the system and the department again, um, and making sure that those resources are available. Um, well, I think everyone who ever has visited downtown San Francisco or the Tenderloin or many other neighborhoods in San Francisco will tell you that the state of our streets is unacceptable. Um, the smell of urine, the smell of feces, sometimes stepping in it. The number one thing that children in the Tenderloin fear is not drug dealers, it's poop. Um, this is done from a, su a study that we did in the Tenderloin. Um, and this is something that I have worked extensively on as, an, as a chief of staff in the District 6 office. Um, that's why we actually did research all over the country, talked to the workers of DPW, to talk to everyone we could, the CBDs, et cetera, business owners. And what we did was we listened to all of that feedback and created the original Proposition B, which the voters passed by 66%, establishing a Department of Sanitation and Streets to be laser focused on getting our streets clean. And yes, it may cost $7 million extra a year, but if that means that we have better oversight, if that means that we have uh, people running DPW and the Department of Sanitation and Streets who are qualified to do that work, if we can eliminate corruption and we, then, and we can actually get our streets clean, then that $7 million out of a $14 billion budget will have been well worth it because tourism and our small businesses and the revitalization of our city depends on us succeeding at this. Listen, we need to give the Department of Sanitation and Streets a shot. It is just about to launch. We should listen to the will of the voters, and if it doesn't work, then we should change it. But this new Proposition B removes many of the protections against corruption, as well as destroying the new department. So I am actually supporting Proposition B this time, and I think this is giving voters an opportunity to take a second look at something that is gonna cost needlessly $7 million. One of the observations I have made um, of city government over the years, and this certainly is something that we're seeing in what we looked at with um, some of the drug policies, but I think it applies citywide. The problem with inefficient delivery of city services is too often uh, something that's attributable to siloing, and making us more siloed um, isn't helpful. And when I'm talking to people 
I respect, like Rachel Gordon, who is a, very knowledgeable about the Department of Public Works, Supervisor Aaron Peskin, and Aaron and I have some disagreements on some policy issues, but when it comes to the efficient delivery of city services and public integrity, um, Aaron is somebody whose judgment I trust, and he had some buyer's remorse about this, and when we both looked at this hard, we concluded that we should go back to voters. I think this is, we can keep the best of the, both worlds with, the, with both oversight commissions, uh, but I'm also convinced you know, that public integrity is, is important to me. I was part of the public integrity team in the city attorney's office in 2004 that did the first report on Mohammed Nuru when he was running the San Francisco League of Urban Gardeners. Um, so I'm familiar with it and I take it equally seriously. I think Proposition B as written keeps the oversight, keeps commissions, um, but doesn't mean we're spending $7 million needlessly to further silo these functions. The same question? Mm -hmm. um, with Proposition B, I feel as though Proposition B needs to include more street toilets, especially in South of Market and the Tenderloin. If we have more places that people can use the bathroom, they won't be shitting on the street. People will use those bathrooms. Uh, it's been, it was a study in the, in the neighborhood about there's not that many people shooting up in the bathrooms anymore. They done moved to the streets to shoot, shoot up and use their drugs. But if we have more bathrooms, rather than every two years, someone is buying these $20,000 garbage cans and put uh, toilets out there where people can use them. You know, I would love to see South of Market on 8th Street, 8th and Mission, where I live at. I would love to see a, a, one of those green toilets there. You know, I would love to see a toilet down by 6th and Howard. I would love to see a toilet going down by 5th and Bryant somewhere. You know, I don't understand why they only have them in certain areas. I know the city can't afford to do it if they want it, but that's why so much doesn't get done because different offices and different agencies of the city create all this policy for the red tape so they don't have to do it and serve the people. So I, I, um, if elected supervisor, I'm gonna change all that. I'm gonna be out there with my people. I'm gonna be talking to everybody I can. Thank in you, Ms. Billy Cooper. All right, the next one. Citywide case management, a district six based partnership between UCSF and the city and county provides care to over 1,500 people experiencing serious mental illnesses every year. What more should be done to help those with unmet mental health needs? And as supervisor, what specific actions will you take to address the ongoing mental health crisis playing out in our streets? I'll begin with Honey Mahogany. Thank you. Again, I feel like a little bit of a broken record here, but <laughs> I have worked for the last 20 years as a social worker in this city, and I've seen a lot. Um, but again, I will say that we need to actually fully fund Mental Health SF. Um, that means that we will be getting our beds fully funded, but it also means that we will be funding enough staff to actually deal with the need. We have something, we have thousands of people on our streets currently in mental health crisis who cannot get the care that they need. We have thousands of people on our streets right now who could be getting into recovery, who could be using up recovery beds. Now, I think that we need to first make sure that the services are in place and are strong enough to, 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 to actually meet the need. And then we need to work on enforcement and setting boundaries on our streets. We need to let people know that no, they cannot continue to use drugs on our streets. That is in fact illegal. We have to set those boundaries. We, you know, if it means that we have to uh, resort to conservatorship in order to get those folks who are so out of their minds that they cannot take care of themselves, then that should be a tool at our disposal. But first, we need to actually make sure that we are fully funding these services and that we have a variety of services where people can actually come in um, uh, at the place where they're ready. Um, you know, not everyone's, not, not everything is a, recovery is not a one size fits all model. We need options for people, a lot of options, so that something can work for them. Um, I agree that uh, 
Mental Health SF, I think, is a promising program, and I do think this is something that needs to be a part of. When I talked about the, the San Francisco Recover Strategy, I want to make sure that that is a part of it. One thing that I think is going to be very important to, in terms of um, what, what I have heard from clinicians who are out in the street dealing with many of these issues is that it's often difficult for them to know how whether someone is presenting in a mental health crisis or a drug-induced crisis because it will present the same way. I'm convinced that if we can make some progress on the drug use, acting out, kind of open air drug scene pro, uh, issues related to this, we will be better empowered and more effective in how we're dealing with people who are gravely mentally ill. Um, I think that, you know, when I have talked to uh, Vitka Eisen at Health Right 360, um, some, of the, some of this is about staffing capacity. We have beds that are, they're recovery beds, but there's also mental health capacity. If we don't have the ability to staff this, the beds are useless to us. And that's why one of the things that I'm proposing is a sober new deal. For people who are new in recovery, who are committed to staying in recovery, I'm reaching out to, we, we have jobs training programs. I've reached out to Jose Cisneros about starting either a grant program or student loan program because the best drug counselors are peer counselors. Um, the best drug counselors I've ever had are the one, and personally, are the ones who've been through it themselves. I wish I could drop names like Matt Dorsey does. <laughs> um, it's dreadful. It's really dreadful. And for the last 12 years, n nothing has worked. Because it's the same way it was from 2000, 22 years of the same um, horrible issues on the street, and no one has created an antidote to, to solve the problems on the street. It's going to take more than with the open air drug dealing. It's going to take more than arresting the drug dealers. You don't need to arrest the people that are using the drugs. Get them help. There, just like Honey Mahogany and Matt Dorsey just said, there are different levels of homelessness and there are different levels of mental health capacity. I was out there. When I was out there, they couldn't give, they finally decided to listen to me. You can't give me a cohesive mental health diagnosis if I'm crazy drugged out, if I come to your office drugged out. And you have to see people for more than five or 10 minutes. That's another issue. We have to see people that come looking for help more than five or 10 minutes. You know, we, we have to change the, the, the system and the way people look at things when it's really helping people, if you really want to help people. So as an essential worker, uh, we worked closely with the UCSF case managers um, and some of the clientele and those who are uh, needing services, you have to uh, make sure that those benefits are available and uh, to help them get the housing that they need in order to pay for it. So that on one end, that's the work that we were doing, ensuring that we're working with uh, uh, getting them the resources they need in order to get uh, obtain services. Uh, and so under that, we need to make sure that we invest in protections for those workers, especially burnout, right? Uh, mental health, um, and making sure that there is resources in that regard. Um, I also would like to see that the nonprofit and department relations between all of these different um, sectors are working cohesive, cohesively together. What I mean by that is the software and the technologies, um, the data that is being provided to the service workers, um, not everybody has access to that. So people are operating within their own departments, providing those resources. So when you know that something's available, such as housing, you'll be able to look that up and be able to see that within the city's district. In order to do that, we have to provide the funding and, and software and training because employees need that uh, in order to conduct the, the job and, and make sure that they have a better job uh, in doing so and providing services. So I wanna see that across the board. So that's making sure that nonprofits and all these different departments that are working on homeless and housingness uh, have that software to work back and forth with each other. Thanks, Cheryl. So the next question, what are your top community safety concerns for your district? I'll begin with Matt Dorsey. 
Well, I'd rather, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I'm going to actually skip the, you've all heard about San Francisco Recovers and why that's a personal priority for me. But I'll tell you, the, one, of, one of the other ones that's important, because I don't think we can accomplish much if we don't solve the police staffing crisis. We have, there is a national phenomenon, and this is not strictly limited to San Francisco, um, but San Francisco is feeling a staffing crunch in its police department that is uh, problematic. It is 25% understaffed. And what that means is that the work that Chief of Police Bill Scott has been doing over the last five or six years um, to create a department that aspires to be a model of 21st century policing, the work that, ca that came out of the reason that Sa the San Francisco Police Commission did a nationwide search to find a chief of police like Bill Scott um, was because of what the kind of reform that our police department needed to do given all the problems it had several years ago. Um, we can't fulfill the promise of that if everybody is running to the next priority, a you know, 911 call. It's about p community policing. It's about building trust. It's about recruiting from the communities that serve us. I think there's a lot of promise um, there. I will say that the last couple of police academy classes are more diverse than ever before in San Francisco history, but we just don't have enough police officers. So that's going to be something we don't solve many public safety problems if we can't solve that. Ms. Billy Cooper. <laughs> um, thank you, Sherelle Jackson. Um, you know, I felt so safe in my neighborhood um, when I saw police walking through the neighborhood. You know, uh, what you call that? Uh, I forget what it's called. What do you call that? Foot patrol. I felt real safe when I, well, I felt a more cohesively sense of safety seeing the police walking through the neighborhoods and getting to know the, 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 the neighbors and the store owners, the, the people that run the shops and everything. We need more of that. We need people to clean the streets more. We really do. People have to clean. The city and county of San Francisco needs to clean the streets more because when they when they clean it once a week or once every two weeks, by the time they come back, it's really screwed up. Um, I think we do, I know it's probably going to kill my career, but I think we do need more police also. I really do. And we need police that are um, culturally sensitive, sensitively trained and cultural competency trained because people that look like me, when we call the police, uh, the numbers are high that we have more, the police give us more problems. You know, we get more pushback from the police and um, uh, some different agencies in the Tenderloin and South of Market have found out that the police don't always write up a report when it's certain people, certain people in the community that are called. Thank so you. we I'm need to take care of that. To, um, Cheryl Jackson. Sorry, I just called stop. Is that what just happened? Yes. Well, you told me to stop. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so what are your top what are your top community safety concerns for your district? Oh. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, so my top community safety concerns is number one, we need to invest in our community safety ambassadors um, throughout the district. Uh, I think they're doing a wonderful job. So if you're out there walking around and you see a community safety ambassador, they're probably out there pro providing food and he help to our uh, homeless individuals that are experiencing homelessness and also to those who are underserved and underprivileged. Uh, you also see them you know, from street to street uh, trying to make sure that uh, we feel a bit more safe, safer out there. And so I want to continue to ensure that as well. Um, I also want to make sure that we invest in our harm reduction. I think that that's in incredibly important as far as addressing um, some of the issues we kind of mentioned before, which was our mental health and substance abuse. Uh, those that are experiencing that, uh, they need to have those resources as well. Uh, and then lastly, we need to ensure that uh, we continue to look at ways in which we invest in more safety for our, our other industries and businesses who need to feel uh, supported uh, within the community and also our residential. They need to feel uh, supported and, and safe uh, while they're residing in their homes. And you know, some of them looking out their window and feeling unsafe is, is not uh, the ideal situation. And so we want to make sure that folks feel safe 
uh, and that our streets are clean. Uh, and I think that we can do that together uh, and working together and getting this done. Thank you. Again, I think that everyone here knows that we have a safety crisis in our streets. Um, as someone who has been working in SOMA, who owns a small business in SOMA, who lives in SOMA, um, I can give you many personal accounts of times where I or my friends have been physically threatened. Um, as someone who, again, owned a, a bar and who has shut down that bar many a times when I was bartending late at night, um, it does feel unsafe. Um, we have had people break into the bar, um, people you know, destroy property, and um, we've had staff that have been threatened. Um, I've had friends that were hit in the head with golf clubs and had their skulls fractured, people who've had their arms broken, people who were shot in the leg, um, all within SOMA. Um, so this is very personal for me. Um, you know, I, 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 I agree that police are a part of the solution here. Um, listen, I have family in SFPD. You don't grow up in San Francisco and not know a lot of people who are act, active police officers. Um, but I also believe that we need to hold SFPD accountable because I can't tell you how many times I heard from small business owners and residents that the police were there and didn't do anything. And that is unacceptable. That should not be tolerated and we need to get to the bottom of that. Because I do believe that we, you know, Police salaries will go up. That is a part of normal labor negotiations. We do need to hire new officers, but we also need someone in the District 6 supervisor seat who's going to hold them accountable, and that person is me. Thank you all for your answers. So with more affordable family housing being built at the former Trans Bay Center, what additional affordable services are needed, such as grocery stores, parks, and schools, and what are your plans to bring those to this community? I'll begin with Miss Billy Cooper. What, what center are you talking about? The question that was submitted was referring to uh, affordable family housing being built at the former Trans Bay Center. Where's that at? That's um, Salesforce downtown. They're not going to build no housing down there. The question is about uh, what additional affordable services are needed, such as grocery stores, parks, and schools, and what are your plans to bring these to the community of your district? Well, I'm going to roll my sleeves up and do everything I can, even if I'm not elected District 6 supervisor, to get uh, um, low-income housing down there, to get school, to get training for individuals, to get um, job trainings, to, to make it more cohesive for people to go back to school, to, you know, I've been here for 40 years, and how come we don't have a, um, a, um, a safe way or something in District 6 or in the Tenderloin? People in, that live in District 6 and the Tenderloin don't really get a chance to have fresh fruit and vegetables, don't get a chance to have um, uh, uh, a chance to have, you know, fresh, uh, to have um, produce that is probably not uh, a couple days old. Um, I've noticed that, you know, um, they had to uh, make people put the fruit and vegetables on the inside because the sun was messing up everything. And uh, I remember looking at the fruit sometime and it was horrible. Just to make it more simpler and easy for people to, um, to have a more affordability to a better way of life. That's what people really need. So many people on the street that we pass by and ignore and don't say hi to are just looking for a better way of life, are just looking to be different, you know, something different, looking to step up. You know, if, you, if, people, if more people reach back and help a person or a couple people move forward, this would be a much better city, I think. Uh, so I think what we have to do, as far as the parks go, we're going to have to work closely with our SX Park and Rec, right? Uh, make sure that they have uh, the resources they need to conduct uh, some method of uh, planning uh, in regards to making sure that the parks are available uh, in this district. But also, I think that we need to look at also investing in community um, farming, okay? And also farmers markets in the area. I think that that's going to provide the fresh fruits that uh, uh, the other candidate was mentioning as well. Um, and also uh, making sure that as uh, we begin to grow, because that is something that's going to happen, we're, for fiscal year after fiscal year, we're going to be forecasted to have more of a, a larger population of folks who want to eventually uh, lay their ground roots here and settle in here. And we have to acknowledge that those that are already residing here, uh, we're going to have to invest in those uh, folks first. Uh, and what I mean by that is there's families that are trying to grow here already. 
uh, and we have to invest in schools and education to make sure that those are readily available uh, for those as well. Um, because you know, if there's not enough schools in the district, you're going to see other schools that are going to be overpopulated. People aren't going to have quality teaching and education, and we already have concerns there as regard. So we need to make sure that we're looking at this full circle and operating in a way that we're successful at it, looking at future years, looking at how many people are going to be in the area, and getting it done. Thank you. For me, for me, um, we definitely need to focus on building much more deeply affordable housing in the district and also making sure that we meet the needs of those residents. And that absolutely means making sure that we get a school in there in Mission Bay. Um, that also means making sure that we have childcare available in the district. Um, and we do, but we need more. Um, I worked as chief of staff to the previous supervisor, Matt Haney. Um, I worked extensively with Rec and Park to, to actually find uh, new parks in South of Market, to find um, pieces of property that we could purchase and turn into green open space because District 6 is one of the districts with the least amount of green space per resident in the entire city. And we know that that has negative health outcomes. We know that people need more green space to enjoy with their families, to exercise. Um, and also, you know, we, we so, and so we need to make sure that we are doing that work. Um, it's something that I have done for the last four years and will continue to do. Um, additionally, I will just mention that um, having affordable, deeply, truly affordable food that is healthy to be able to purchase is something that is truly rare in Soma. Um, many of the grocery stores are unaffordable to many of the families. Uh, many of them end up shopping at food, like Food Smarts or um, you know, um, um, some of the smaller chain stores. And we have programs to help actually uh, have fresh groceries in some of those smaller markets, but we need to do more. And so we need to, I will be working with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, Office of Small Business, to increase the number of f uh, supermarkets and fresh food that's available in the South of Market. This is actually a really great question. And the reason it is is because if we accomplish what we're hoping to accomplish in the new housing element cycle over the next eight years, um, everything you think you know about wealthy neighborhoods is going to change. We're, if we're going to have, if we're going to fulfill the promise of affordability on site, 